and I encourage you to all um, swap out your generic icon for a photo of yourself that shows your face. And if anybody in chat has a good idea on how to, I'd love to stream music at the beginning of these labs. Um, in our face-to-face -face labs, I'd always have a jazz station going um, on Pandora. And it's just kind of a way to keep the room activated. So when people walk in, they don't, or in this case, log in, they don't feel like they're walking into a dead room. Because when you do that in Blackboard Collaborate, you'll notice that as soon as you joined, it seemed like the chat window was empty. Um, it's not a persistent chat in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. So it's a good idea to, um, if you're having something in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, turn on your camera, make some noise. Um, and I'm looking for ways to uh, stream music just so people walk in, they don't feel like it's a dead space. All right, it's 106, let's get going. Welcome to today's Active Teaching Lab. Um, today's focus is on fast, effective, and do-it-yourself video. Let me turn off my screen sharing. And there you are. Um, as I mentioned, uh, so this is going to be a, a session that focuses on sort of oh my gosh, what am I going to do that since I can't lecture anymore, I want to be able to talk to my students, I want them to be able to see my face, to see that I'm a human, so I don't want to just share documents and readings, but I want to um, have video, live video, right? Because video is sort of, a, as we've seen in some of the recent um, nationally televised uh, sessions that the nation is going through, it can be a very intimate format if we do it right. And we want to have that sort of intimate format. It's like, I want to speak to you individually, not to you collectively as a class. You don't often see me on video doing this and ignoring you. And I, and I might be doing this as I look at another monitor and I'm not looking at you, but I'm right in front of you. So um, there's an opportunity to have a very sort of intimate um, relationship, if you will, with your students in, in you know, good intimate, not bad intimate, um, with video. So let's figure out how to do that. Now, one of the things that's kind of awesome in general is that these devices have made your students really familiar with poor quality video. They're Often many of them are happy with the TikTok videos that are doing this and shaking all over the place. The audio is sometimes good, sometimes not good. Um, and we'll talk about audio and videos and the audio part of videos because that's a very important part. But the good news is that it's accessible. People are used to it and the actual video quality isn't nearly as important as um, some of the other elements of it. So we'll talk about some of the other elements. It's a very accessible format um, that was not so accessible um, several years ago as far as being able to create and make your own videos. So I'm going to jump over to the activity sheet now. And some of you are already in it, and I appreciate that. Um, what I encourage for this is to um, if you have two monitors or if you can have enough space on your um, laptop for two windows, to go ahead and um, jump over to that um, to that tab or have them both open. Um, I'm not, I, you know, my, my little picture will be in the bottom corner of your screen if you really want to see that, but that's not so important in my opinion. Um, but a lot of the action is going to happen over here. And I'm going to share it on my screen so we, you can access it in two different ways. You can see what, watch what I'm doing in Blackboard Collaborate, and I'll highlight things every once in a while. Um, and you'll be able to see it in the Blackboard Collaborate window. Or you'll also be able to see it in the live Google Chrome. Um, I'm sorry, not Google Chrome, the Google Doc tab as well. So we've got different options there. So. I'd like to start off with sort of a, an invitation for um, any of the participants. Um, if you're not super happy about typing, 
uh, I want to give you an alternative. Go ahead and raise your hand any time throughout the session, and we'll call on you and give you uh, voice access to this. Um, you can also do that if you're really good at typing and you just want to emphasize something and you feel like the text version of, uh, of your question isn't as powerful enough or we're reading it wrong or something like that. Um, so, all right, Jen, we'll have that activity sheet shared with you in just a second. I think JT will get that. No, here, I'll do that. That, that link should open up that activity sheet. So, again, the activity sheet, we've got questions at the top. If you don't know what questions to ask, scroll down, and we've got some very easy sort of resources and tips farther on down that you should be able to access, or maybe um, you'll be like, oh, I want to know more about this. So do I really want to use my face? That's really important, right? Well, let's look at that and ask about it and talk about it. Um, so resources down below, some easy, medium, and difficult things to try. And then at the very bottom, we've got a few more resources. If you've got more resources, go ahead and add those to the bottom. Just edit it like you would. All right, so any questions to start off with from the participants? If you've never been to one of these labs, we're not a canned uh, curriculum session. Uh, we're not like a, a training session necessarily. Uh, you come in with your questions and we will uh, improvise and try to answer them. And I've got a bunch of uh, great moderators um, here to help me out who know their way around audio and video. But I also recognize that participants, you all have experiences as well. So jump in. You are experts as well. All right, and if there are no questions from audio, let's just jump into the, the, the top one in Blackboard Collaborate, or I'm sorry, in, in, uh, in the Google Doc. How does playing videos work in Blackboard Collaborate? Uh, can students hear it, and are there known issues? All right, really great question. Does anyone want to um, build on that? as far as the question goes. If you haven't yet started playing with Blackboard Collaborate and you're planning on using it, jump in and do that. Try it out. Uh, you can invite a friend, you can invite a family member or a neighbor or whatever to be your students. You can have give them the guest link and try this out. You can have the guest link and open it up by yourself on another, um, on a second computer if you have one or on your phone. That's not super great, but um, it works. So you can test out a lot of these things and see exactly what happens. So plain videos works. Um, if you want, I can do a quick demonstration of that. But I'm not going to actually because um, this is, I would like it to, I would like us to focus more on <sighs> less on the synchronous video like Zoom and Teams and such, we will have assignments or we will have um, resources on that. And on the right-hand side, the of the table, we'll have um, people add to that. But uh, we'll focus more on sort of creating videos as learning objects. And that reminds me, we are recording. Thank you, Karen, for starting the recording. Last week we forgot. All right, so captions. Who would like to talk about captions? I've got moderators here I, I can call on on that. JT, go ahead. So my name is JT. I'm now in the Department of French and Italian. And one of the advantages to offering both captions and a transcript is for students to be able to connect um, immediately with the written word as well, so they're hearing um, and reading at the same time. So you're able to work on that um, listening, reading, speaking, and eventually writing as, um, writing as well. Um, a transcript can be an, a useful tool as well, just because um, it's sort of a set, uh, not a set paragraph, but it's sort of a, a set thing. Students are not really ad-libbing, you're reading something, so that could be easy for you 
as a speaker, you already have to, to at least practice your cadence, to practice your rhythm, um, and to highlight, you know, I guess um, in terms of intonation, um, certain words and phrases that might be useful for students. Um, as a, just as a starting point, it is time intensive to do captioning, um, especially in a foreign language. Um, but I do think that Kaltura um, does allow for machine captions in foreign language. And I do know that uh, Dan Lavalle is inputting some resources into the chat now. Maybe okay. um, if there are any other foreign language um, colleagues, maybe Dan, if you could share a little bit about foreign language support with Kaltura. All right, I have so, recent experience with French, but you're the expert. And I, I might be the Kaltura expert, but I'm definitely not <laughs> the foreign language expert. And that's why I am really hoping that I can get somebody who speaks or uses foreign language media uh, to let me know how well some of the foreign language machine captioning works in Kaltura. Right. Um, I was, I, I'm kind of joking about not being not shutting up about captioning, but um, I'm also half serious in that uh, I don't want to monopolize the session. In short, you can order machine captions in Kaltura. Machine captions just means the computer's going to try to recognize what you're saying. It does it with, it depends on what kind of microphone you're using and um, how much background noise there is, but it's around 75 to 85% accurate. We generally tell people it's about 75% accurate just to kind of start on the low end and to encourage you to review those machine captions, edit them, and make them accurate before actually displaying them to users. Um, in short, when you order them, I, I want to mention this. When you order machine captions in Kaltura, uh, a lot of people get confused because they don't uh, show up immediately. And the reason for that is we did a pilot and our accessibility uh, experts and professionals and uh, disability resource professionals on campus uh, strongly uh, encouraged us to not um, encourage instructors to just make unedited machine captions available uh, as is. They wanted uh, people to review them, make them accurate before displaying them. That's all kind of spelled out in those KB documents I shared. Uh, as far as foreign languages, though, I do want to answer that. And the fact is, I don't actually remember every single language that we've activated. Uh, let me see here. I'm looking it up. How quick can I be? Here we go. Uh, at the moment, we've got uh, Arabic, Dutch, English, German, French, Hebrew, Hindi, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Mandarin, Chinese, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, Swedish, and Turkish. Again, I don't know how well they work, but I would love if uh, you try using those, um, if you would let me know how well it works or how, how well it does not work. Um, All right, challenge I'll leave thrown. It Thank you very much, Dan. And go ahead, Bill. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that that you know I use I use transcripts. Um, actually, a lot of the recordings I'm doing, uh, people are using teleprompters. Um, it, if if they're sticking to the script, it makes it very easy once we have to then close caption. But what I also do when I'm creating, uh, you know, putting in classes, I since a lot of the classes I'm doing right now, uh, one in particular is a lot of literature. Um, is I I have the uh, the transcript below the video, and that I also have a number of students who who, who English is not their first language, um, and uh, they they use the the transcript below um, as a as a way to when they're going back and and really studying for the exams. Um, it's also if, if we ask them to you know to to cite sources and and quotes. So, um, but I, what I don't yeah. do is is add a lot of pictures. In, in those uh, in that text, but it's just a, it's just a, a double way of, of providing the uh, closed captioning as well as the transcript. But you, I believe you always a, need. Yeah, go ahead. That's a really good uh, a really good point. Um, and I've seen instructors who do this very very well. Um, it takes some practice to read from a transcript without looking like you read from a transcript, right? But the more times you do it, the better you get at it. So that idea of just having it right below that little green light on your laptop and using a Google Doc and sort of reading through that works pretty well. And I think, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think that if you don't do it exactly the same, if the trans, like, is, uh, is there such a, a parallel to decorative text? So if you add little side things in the, um, in your, presentation that are not in the transcript, do those need to be added to the transcripts or 
do the main, if the main points are covered in the transcripts, do you need to, is that, is that well enough? I don't know the answer to that, but somebody can maybe jump onto that. Timo, you've got a question or comment. Go ahead. Yeah, two. Uh, one is to uh, build off what, what Dan LaValle said in terms of uh, the accuracy of captioning and your microphone source. Uh, I did some, I've been doing a lot of recording this summer. Uh, I, when I got a better microphone, I found my accuracy in machine captioning uh, much uh, more accurate with a better microphone. So uh, thinking about audio sourcing, uh, microphones really do play a large role in the um, accuracy of those machine captionings. And then also to mention that particularly when you're in Canvas, uh, there is a new video embed player that allows you both to um, reveal the caption as well as the transcript. So you can uh, you don't have to choose between those. Uh, there is a nice new player that uh, will display a link that you can click on, which will expand uh, the transcript of the video as well as your ability to change it to show the caption over the, the video. Excellent point. And, and let's take that point to emphasize what I think is the number one tip for anything that you do with video don't use your uh, don't use your laptop microphone. Don't use your computer microphone. Get a headset and or get a, a good USB microphone. Um, and I don't even know if it has to be a good USB microphone. It'll be better than your uh, your laptop microphone. Um, thoughts on that, Bill, Dan, Timo, anyone? David, yes. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I just add that proximity plays a big role. So if you have a microphone that you can just get closer, you're going to get more clarity out of that recording. And then the other thing that we've been doing this semester in light of the tra transcript um, feature within the Canvas uh, or the Kaltura player, rather, is just making a uh, direct link available in addition to whatever embed we're using on a Canvas page so that students can access like a little bit of the uh, unique attributes of the player on media space and um, that would include the transcript uh, player it would include things like um, you know increased speed i mean those things are available and on the regular embed as well but just to have that backup is kind of a nice thing all right, and then Bill, you got just a minute for this last word, and we'll uh, then move on to the next question. Uh, I'm just saying one of the most important things is is have a windscreen or just be be aware of your breathing. Um, that can be extremely annoying. Um, and if you are using a, a headset, ideal you can adjust it. But if you're using a you have a desktop microphone, the recommendation is about a fifth a fist length away from the microphone. That's uh, that that usually produces the best audio. The worst thing is to get too close to a microphone, then it gets overmodulated, or being too far away. All right, great. All right, next question. How can we be mindful of a student's possibly possibly limited bandwidth? And that's a really good point, because in a regular face-to-face -face classroom, you're kind of aware that they've got good bandwidth, for both Wi-Fi and um, there aren't obstructions. You can see that there's no um, issues with them understanding or hearing you necessarily. Um, but you don't know what their house is like. You don't know what their bandwidth plan is like. Um, you don't know if they've got um, family members or roommates who are also online in a Zoom call eating up their low bandwidth at the time. They might be in the parking lot of the local library with kids in the back of the car. All of these things are really sort of things to be aware of when we are working with videos. So thoughts and responses on that, other than the ones that are in here. So this and a, is, thank you again for everybody doing the, uh, the, the right-hand side. Go ahead, Timo. Yeah, so there are uh, some quick tip uh, documents on instructional continuity uh, that address a lot of these low bandwidth issues, but a couple of highlight, things I can highlight. Uh, one of those things is, is uh, using the, especially in Canvas, using the, in, the download option uh, when you're embedding video into Canvas. This is going to allow students to have low bandwidth to be able to download that video as opposed to stream it. So uh, some st so, so a student can download the video once and then watch it multiple times instead of streaming it multiple times. 
This also allows students to be able to download it at low peak times, so maybe in the middle of the night, uh, so they don't have to compete with high speed times. So those are that's a one one tip, uh, thing. But as well as uh, again, the larger thing is to making sure that we're not creating these super long videos uh, that students have to that are they're so large that downloading is um, problematic. Great, and I put a link to that instructional continuity resource. Um, in the document there as well. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you. I was looking for it, but I couldn't find it, so thanks. Uh, I, I used to, I used to broadcast 90-minute lectures. Don't don't do that. I, I'm don't do that, people. Don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm contractually obligated to say that you need to uh, shorter videos are easier to uh, to to stream to download. Um, one of the tricks that we used a lot in the past before technology like like Cultura that kind of adjusts the the, the how fast your computer can process stuff is we would it's you know buffering the video we, we would load we would load the video embedded into a page let the video start to buffer and we distract the students by reading text or looking at a picture while the video was was kind of buffering below and they'd scroll down and then start to play the video um, Cultura handles a lot of that Dan is can speak more on that today um, but downloading is is an option uh, we've done we do that for a lot of students who travel the one thing when you produce videos for people when they download is closed captioning and so in that case we oftentimes do open captioning and that's that's now a lot easier to do um, and you just have the, the captioning right there um, on the video it's, itself so Oh yeah, right. So, and and you can do the same thing sort of in slides too, right? You're not supposed to have bullet points on slides, but um, for many slide presentations that I've done, and this is actually, you may not need to do a video of you lecturing. You may only be able to do, may only need to do a narrated PowerPoint. And I think we'll probably talk about that in in a little bit. But they don't need to see your face, and we will talk about that a little bit. Uh, later on, but I've done things where, yeah, use the presenter notes in your PowerPoint, in your Google Slides, etc., and let that do a lot of the captioning for you. All right, any other questions on that? Otherwise, we've talked about captioning a little bit and screen. Oh, screen capture. Um, so screen capture. That's uh, Kaltura has got a good option for that. Um, does the person who asked this question? want to ask a little bit more or are you satisfied with our answer? We didn't really talk about screen capture on Kaltura, but Kaltura has a screen capture option. Um, and maybe somebody can put a link on that, although that's really about captioning. So let's talk about lighting. Um, in the document down below, we've got a section on cameras and lighting that um, Bill helped me, or Bill put together basically. Um, and one of the big things is use a window. And if you look at my picture again, or my video again, I've got a window right in front of me behind the screen. So that helps me in two ways. One, it gives me nice even lighting during the day, daytime, which is when I do my video casting. Um, but it also lets me look out the window, which is kind of, sometimes I need that, otherwise I feel like I'm locked up in a computer screen. So that's one great, great tip. Um, for indoor lighting, ceiling light, and you could put a, a, a light on either side of you. Those ring lights are available online um, for about 20, 30 bucks, not so much. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice. Uh, a direct light will cast shadows, so the more dispersed it is. What else am I, that's the diffuse light that we're talking about here. Um, and then go ahead, Bill. I was going to just, um, yes, yeah, video loves light, so as much light as possible. Newest cameras now can handle very low lighting situations. Um, but the kind of light that you want to work with is the more diffuse the lighting, the better. Um, a real simple low expense, low, low cost trick is to use, I don't know if you people can see the, my video at all. Um, I brought along, you use like the cooking parchment paper um, I use that as a you know, it's, it's don't don't use wax paper because you'll melt like a window even. shade um, basically or a lampshade you use the parchment of paper as a lampshade yeah well I use it, to, it? To, yeah just a place over the uh, over the lamp itself um, you, if, if you use the the cooking parchment paper um, you can put that right right on right next to a bulb if you don't want to buy the actual tough gels that 
the production production gels. Yeah. Um, We're and then, then about when you, easy, so we don't want to buy anything. Well, this is like a. These are like if if you see that, they're Good like tip. these are three dollars that you can get. Yeah, parchment paper. No, I'm saying the, you're the gels. Yeah. Then when you're of course when you're done with your uh, with your your video, you can always bake some cookies with it. Um, it's a very simple low cost trick to have nice diffuse lighting. Um, and the other thing too is important is color temperature. Most cameras can can handle balancing, but you want to try to have all your lights be this be the same uh, as best you can. And computer screens are usually 5600 Kelvin, so if if people have a very blue look to themselves when they're speaking, it's because they have their they're too close to their monitors or the monitor is, is turned up quite a bit. So um, yeah. just turn down your your monitor uh, the brightness and turn up the lights in your room. That usually fix the problem. And yeah, the, so the conversation in the in the chat and here the glare on the glasses, right? If we have this, I have the same same issue with my reading glasses that I need for the screen. And if I do have one of those ring lights, that'll show up and it'll look like I've got these two glowing donuts in my eyes. So that is a, a challenge. Um, Mallory's got a great dis, uh, suggestion in the in the chat, which is having diffused light and having um, having it indirect. So that's where things like the 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 larger the light source. So using something behind that parchment paper, for example will really diffuse that. If you have those really shiny individual lights, then they will look like your pupils are glowing. Um, so that's that's a really good way to, to, to solve that problem. So thanks. All right, um, editing. This is out of my frame, so um, folks on editing, go ahead. Raise your hand and we're gonna, we're gonna jump in. Yeah, Dan. So um, for those of you who have heard me talk about this before, you're going to hear something really familiar. Um, unfortunately, my go-to software that I would recommend for many uh, is not currently licensed by UW-Madison, but the rumor is that it might be. It's TechSmith's Camtasia. You can use that for both doing screen recordings, you can record yourself on your webcam, but you can also use it to do video editing. And I like it because it's pretty easy to use, it's intuitive. It's not super expensive, but um, I have bought a license for myself because it's uh, so good. So I'm hoping Madison will eventually license it. I keep hearing that it's in process, but I just, I don't know where that's at. Uh, as far as licensed tools, um, I'm gonna just be, uh, my take is that the professional video editing tools that we have access to, Adobe Premiere, it's a great video editing tool, but it is a professional video editing tool. What do I mean by that? It mean, I mean that it's probably not a tool that most instructors are gonna wanna take the time to learn. With that said, if you wanna do a lot of work in video, it's probably worth spending some time on. LinkedIn Learning has some great tutorials on using it. Um, I still would recommend TechSmith Camtasia over uh, Adobe Premiere. Adobe uh, Premiere Rush was mentioned. Um, it is easy to use. It's, it's basically Adobe's uh, attempt at creating an iMovie-like tool. Uh, iMovie, of course, is a Mac OS a video editing tool that you can use. Um, my issue with Rush is the projects, at least when I tried it, are tied to the machine. You can't save them and move them to another machine, which is kind of a deal breaker as far as I'm concerned. Uh, when I looked, Adobe kind of acknowledged that that's an issue and they were gonna incorporate uh, a feature to allow people to move projects between machines in the future. So hopefully they will have done that. Um, so I wanna jump I'm in here there. as well with the, um, the old way of editing videos, which is to keep it simple, right? If you have really short videos, it will take less editing. Um, Kaltura lets you trim off the front and the back of it. Is that correct? I think that's correct. And I think you can even take, clumsily, take chunks out of the center. Am I right on that? Yeah, you are. And why am I, why am I saying that with kind of this has reservation? I, I'm I kind of idea. with you. <laughs> I, but basically, if you can, try to upload video that looks and sounds the way that you want it to to Kaltura. Kaltura's editing tools, they're there. They're a thing. I, I might be responsible for, for Kaltura. That doesn't mean that I have to be a cheerleader saying that everything they've done is awesome. Their editor is one of the things that, in my opinion, is not awesome. Um, occasionally, people run, run into issues with it. But you can do basic things like you just said. Trim off the start, 
the end or a little bit in the middle. Uh, it's just that the tools are not very fine grained. Um, sometimes you can't, you just want to edit out a little bit and you can't do it. Um, and then I'm if okay you've uploaded that, a because... video, yeah. If you've done I mean, it, if you're doing it on a big video, it can take quite a while for it to process. Yeah, this lab is not about making those massive, you know, opus magnus, magnus opus, you know, epic films. This is this lab is about how do I do quick and dirty videos that are acceptable and that are good enough for my students to to do. So keep it simple, your students. The good news again, they're used to bad video. There, you're saved. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I was going to say that the. Uh... The best editing is is having a good good camera person, um, and one of the first things that you teach in a in a in a production class is how to do editing inside the camera. Um, you know, so so and if you look back at really old old films, they would do a lot of the a lot of the editing right there inside inside the camera. What I mean by that is is don't think you can fix it in post. Uh, you know, do it. Right. You know. Do it. Do a take um, with the intention that that's that's how the the clip is going to be, and the more mindful you are about uh, when you're recording, the the easier it's gonna easier it's gonna be in the editing room. All right, great. And I see that we've got a chat chat already going on about the next one, which is interactive quizzes in Kaltura um, with narrated PowerPoints. We've got some um, information here already on the the KB that was shared. And there's information on the chat going on. As I look at our time left and I look at the um, elements that are left in our presentation here, um, I, I just want to ask uh, for the person who is asking this question on creating an in interactive quiz, do you feel like you have resources? Or do, would you like us to talk more about it? And not hearing a, an answer, I will. Point to Bill. Go ahead. If you had your hand up. All right. Okay. Uh, Eye contact uh, with. Yeah, that, that, ahead, was left over from, that was left over from before. Sorry about that. All right. No worries. All right. So, eye contact with camera seems important, but I find it uncomfortable. Oh my gosh. You're not the only one doing this all day, looking at the camera. We are like Zoom fatigue is real and it's not super intuitive or friendly to be looking at a little green light. Um, so there are tips and tricks, right, David? Go ahead. Sorry about that. OK, um, this is the thing that I made here. Oh, that's the wrong camera. I'm sorry. Here, I made this. It's a little uh, collage of people that I stick to the back of my computer and then I can like my eye can trace across those different people. All right. Do you would you? That's a really cool idea. That's a cool trick. So if you were in the Google Doc and you didn't see a picture of what what David just showed up, he just found a a picture and of, of multiple people, cut a little hole in the center of it, and he puts it around the camera or right behind the camera um, so that he can sort of scan from person to person, um, and that that is kind of a neat psychological uh, trick. Can you take a picture of that and put it in the in the in the document, David? Sure. Yeah, you bet. Could awesome. you could you also bring that back on the screen? There are some people in the chat who wanted to uh, see it more closely. Thank you. Here, let me turn off the the application so you can all highlight David's. Um, there it is. You can you can make that bigger. And it's just a little picture of a bunch of people. With David, a if you can, and David, if you can say something. Yeah. Um, so I made this little collage in Photoshop. And um, and then I printed it out on a black and white printer um, and then just glued it to some foam core that was like basically trash. The circle is um, something that I can put around a lens. But I also just put some double-sided tape like here so that I can put it on the reverse of my um, computer or laptop so that it's like right above the inline camera. Like All right. So. Awesome. And if you are, um, if you have trouble with public speaking, you know that whole trick about um, having naked people? You don't even have to imagine it. You can just go online and do that. Never mind. Okay. Uh, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Eye contact. 
Options for collaborative work, multimodal quizzes, and assignments. Okay, I'm not understanding. This is this seems less video related. Can someone help me figure out how to make this more video-ish? I'm going to skip over that and say let's focus on the video stuff. And if you want to add more to it, um, to talk about the video angle, uh, please do. All right, how do we deal with spacing? Bill, go ahead. I, I could say that I've worked with the School of Social Work on a number of projects. They've done role playing where, where students take the role of, of a client intervention and that's made into a video. That's that's a very that's that's one use of a video if you wanted to have a, a role playing assignment. So Oh yeah, yeah. Well and in uh, student groups and somebody can correct me in this, but if you put students if in Canvas you give you put students into groups, the students then have their own discussion forums, for example, that they can start and stop. They have their own Blackboard Collaborate um, instances that they can open up rooms. They can create those own their own videos of and record those videos of them having a Blackboard Collaborate chat. I imagine they could probably do the same thing in uh, WebEx and Teams, etc. Um, so they could. They could do that and create an analog, well, a video um, artifact for you to go through. That's not necessarily e the easiest thing to grade um, if you have to go through that, but it's 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 a, it's a possibility. All right, spacing out students. Oh my gosh. Yeah, remember they're on Zoom as much or more than you are, so they've got fatigue as bad or worse than you do, and they are going to need to take some breaks. If you've got a long session, please do not make, do not do a two hour synchronous video class. That's gonna be so hard for them. Um, and they're going to space out. I will space out. I'm gonna space out in a few minutes here. Um, so it's hard and it's tough. The second part of that question is the multiple messages coming in. We have the chat going on with Timo talking about pugs, and we have the Google Doc going on, and we've got the audio, and if you're watching you know, my, my video, that going on as well. It can be super overwhelming. Now, we do that because we know that there are some people who like to talk more, and there are some people who like to chat more. Um, we know that students um, now more than ever are used to having this sort of background chat in the background, um, and I want to capture that so the as we mentioned the blackboard collaborate chat is not persistent so that goes away if you log out and you come back in it's all gone so having our a place to capture that in the google doc lets us do that so we've got multiple things going on here and we're letting you make those choices it is a lot though all right yep the going back and forth um Choose your choose your poison. Which one works best for you? I think would be the, the way that I have that. All right. Any other thoughts on that before I move on? All right. We've got about 15 minutes here. Oh, you know what? There's a there is a really nice uh, thing going on in chat. Um, and that is. Uh, all right, so Lauren's got the yes, have students watch the chat. Um, as an instructor, it's nice to have somebody watch the chat. Um, from time to time, JT will raise his hand and say, hey, John, there's a really cool thing happening in chat that I think you should address because I'm not able to address it because I'm talking and my mind is going in these other places. Um, but some great ideas for breakout rooms um, in the Teach Online at UW and preparing to teach online. Um, we've seen some really awesome activities where um, we have Google Slides that you can assign the breakout groups to. Every breakout group has a slide that they fill out as sort of a worksheet. And that way they get to work together on something. Uh, they get to see what other groups do. It's very easy for you as an instructor to zoom, zoom back and forth between the different slides to see if they're on task. Um, and that's an awesome, um, that's an awesome synchronous awesome synchronous activity for breakout groups. 
Okay, UW-Madison requirements for intros and ending slides. I don't think we do. Does anyone know? I don't think we do. I'm going to say no, and if there was one, well, I don't know. Not yet. Maybe not yet, but I don't think so. Um, what kind of time commitment should I plan on a video? Uh, for example, if I record a 10-minute lecture, how long will that affect it uh, to upload and such? Um, this is a thing we talked a lot about in spring, right, Dan LaValle? Indeed. Um, so the big takeaways, if I remember correctly, and jump in and, and, and correct me if I'm not, is keep them short because the shorter the videos, the less errors you're going to have in uploading them and the less errors the students are going to have in downloading them and the less errors there will be in processing them. Yes? Yeah. Yep. And yeah. I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but I was just typing this in there. And a lot of video software will let you um, – choose what's called the video frame size or the frame size. And you'll see something like 19, like 1080p or 720p. And I often recommend 720p or that 1280 by 720 as kind of being a good, uh, a good balance between high video quality and not too big a file size. Yeah. Um, there's, lot, there's a ton more variables in here. Uh, the, the other big one to be aware of is most of us are working from home, so we're using home internet connections, right? And I've had a number of charter outages or slowdowns, and the upload speed is not the same as what we get on campus. So it takes longer to upload video files. Yeah. Let me add one more thing before I, I turn this over to Bill, because um, I, I see his hand is up as well. It depends on what you want to do. So if you're just lecturing, they don't need to see your face. They don't need a really good, necessarily, a high quality uh, resolution right, because they can read the text on the screen or um, in the transcripts or whatever. Um, however, if you are doing a demonstration of a fine, de finely detailed machine or, or something, you might need a higher resolution um, image or a higher resolution uh, yeah, image. If that's the case, keep the videos nice and short and focus on the um, the size of the video rather than on the time of the video. So just do what you need to do in you know, each chapter and have multiple chapters rather than say, oh, I'm going to go over this whole machine that I'm demonstrating that they have to learn how to do. Um, and it's got to be at high res and it's going to be 30 minutes long. Try to not do that. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I, I have three kids um, ages 9 to 16. And so during the day, I'm competing with with every single electronic device in the house. So if if uh, if you ever look at the videos that I post, it's usually around uh, 2 a.m. or 3 o'clock, 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, probably not telling everybody this. Everyone's going to go and upload videos and, and ruin this. Uh, no, I but, sleep at that time. But you know, I just I set the computer up and just just upload all the videos late at night. Um, then I then I go to sleep and then 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 they're ready once once I wake up in the morning. Um, that's that's or or I just you know that's that's what I do from home. So I recommend I recommend that. Um. All right, very good. And in the chat there, um, there's a question about the videos. Uh, great advice from Lauren. I tell people four to six minutes, and so that way the students end up staying within six to eight minutes because we always over overflow what we think that we're going to do. Are there etiquette tips, norms, and rules at the beginning of the video sessions? So one of the things that comes up a lot is, should I require my students to have their light, uh, their cameras turned on? Um, I would say, please think about this before you require it. Some of your students might, one, be sharing bandwidth with family members, um, roommates, etc. So they won't, they can't. They just they don't have the bandwidth. Two, they might be in a situation that they don't want you to see what's in the background because they're embarrassed about it or it's not as cool looking or as beautiful as the person who has the lake house um, and has the, you know, the storks in the background. There are lots of different things that are happening um, that we don't know about. So whenever possible, be courteous to your students and flexible with them and understanding and empathetic about what their situations might be. Um, 
otherwise, what I have at the beginning of my slides or my sessions are just sort of a little um, overview. Please add a picture to your profile, right? So that's that's something that I feel is okay to ask. Um, but yeah, turning off the bandwidth is good. So maybe have a time where they have their 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 thing on and they can say hi and say, hey, look, I'm I'm good. Everything. Hope you're all well. That's good. Um, but probably not for the whole course you don't or a session you don't want people doing that. All right, video whiteboard. My favorite tip on the video whiteboard is down on easy use a webcam stand for demonstrations. Go to Amazon or whatever and get one of these little flexible gooseneck things um, for your camera or you can make one out of a cardboard box and a, like, a shadow box sort of thing and put a little whiteboard underneath that or don't use a whiteboard, use a sheet of paper and write on it, have the camera above looking over that way it, they see your hand and you can emphasize and you can circle things emphatically around what you're doing and you can write in whatever, you don't have to use your mouse to write because that's terrible. Um, you have to invest in a Wacom, tab Wacom tablet or anything like that. <laughs> use the whiteboards, use a sheet of paper, something like that. Just get a stand and flip it upside down and turn it around so that it's not upside down. That is my favorite um, how to do that. Any other thoughts, questions, ideas? And then in Blackboard Collaborate, you can switch the camera and you can do the same thing with Teams or, or, or other things. All right. Zoom and Canvas. Zoom is not being um, integrated into Canvas this fall. So, and we don't know when Zoom will be turned on for campus this fall. So probably the best idea is to not plan on using it, at least for the first half. Um, and then we start talking about, are you, is it a good idea to switch halfway through and move from one platform to the other platform? Uh, I don't know. Um, I like Zoom better than I like Blackboard Collaborate, like many people. Um, but I'm planning on using Blackboard Collaborate. So that's, uh, and Karen loves Blackboard Collaborate. That's good. All right, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, JT. Um, are there, does anyone know any updates of whether or not um, Blackboard Collaborate will allow for 24 or 25 different tiles? I heard over the summer, I heard that was a thing by the beginning of the fall semester, um, but I'm not sure if that's still the case. I heard nine, but yeah, don't know. All right, uh, anything less than that? I don't think so, okay. External, we've got seven minutes left and only two questions, so we'll even have some time for face, uh, more face-to-face -face, uh, live questions after this as well, I think. Uh, microphones and earbuds. Somebody can talk on this. Um, Ed and I can. For example, Timo, you use a Blue Snowball microphone, right? Uh, it's not a snowball, but it's like that. But I do, what I'm presenting, uh, have an earbud, uh, my earpod in my ear. Uh, so I can, the microphone isn't hearing what's coming out of the sound source, so. All right, yeah, because that echo thing really ruins, again, in many ways, audio is more important than video in videos. So just keep that in mind, and, and it, it makes sense. There's, a, there's an intimacy of, of being whispered to in your ears, right? Uh, that, that isn't there with the, the visual. Yeah, and I think um, the audio quality of uh, like something like, like the snowball is a little bit better, can be a little bit better than the headset, but the headset uh, microphone systems are, are pretty darn good too. So yeah. I, don't know, I don't know that it's necessary to get something like a uh, snowball, but um, if you're gonna use something like that, uh, like I do, I would recommend having that some type of uh, earbud. Yeah, my snowball mic disappeared on me. <clears throat> so someday I'll get it back maybe. All right, and the last question, unless people have more, so start thinking about it. 
Thoughts on doing casual TikTok style videos versus formal video presentations? Oh, I love the thoughts. David, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I've done a little bit of experimentation here. It's a very creative environment right now with TikTok and, and Flipgrid. What I have done is, you know, I've done one that's sort of generic, um, and then it gives you a download. So you're essentially using these platforms as a creative area and then using the video that's produced traditionally. That's sort of one approach that bridges the instructional side and the social media side. Okay. And uh, go ahead, Bill. Oh, I'm going to date myself again, but but back in the old days when we used to broadcast, we'd always have, um, I, remember, I remember people used to have VHS machines and you'd set your timer to record. Usually things were always off by about a minute or so. So what we used to do for fun is the first minute of a, of a lecture was just kind of a, a introduction by the faculty member. Had nothing not, nothing really to do with the, the content always. And it was just kind of a, a, like a welcome intro. Um, but that's to be the most popular with the students. It just kind of humanized the, the instructor. We just had a lot of fun. Um, so that's that's when I, I think the value of short videos. And we're, I'm talking, you know, 25 years ago we were doing this, and we're still doing it today with, with, with faculty. So it just gets them out of out of that kind of lecture mode, and 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 as students, I think students enjoy it. So I I, I will echo that. I and I think that you know in many ways. Ask your students, um, and then get get your students to make videos too, because that'll really set the tone. Videos are much more informal feeling than um, than not having them right. Um, oftentimes, if they are willing, they will show their surroundings, and having a person in context with their their home situation is way more personal and way more sort of like you know more about me, so you know whether you can trust me or not based on I don't know terrible photos or my half set of world book encyclopedias or uh, you know whatever it is but the informality of that um, introduces a vulnerability and I think that those informal videos make you a little bit more human they allow us chances to be imperfect to make mistakes and then recover from them um, as a tech person I'm always sort of secretly delighted when the technology doesn't work for me because I have it, because it gives people a, it, it, it breaks down those barriers people say oh you're the tech person it should work great for you and I'm like no I have the problems just like you you can do this I do this we're both humans we're all humans so um, we have these problems go ahead Bill um, I also worked with the political science department a number of courses over the years and um, one of the things we used the short videos for was uh, to kind of correct, or not correct, but but the the videos, the lectures were you know were set for in a certain time period, maybe filmed like a six months, you know, three months in advance. And uh, I had one professor, for example, was talking about the Syrian war, and he, and rather than going back and refilming the whole lecture. We used that short little video to say to open the whole class by saying, "I was completely wrong on this whole thing." Um, when you watch the next lecture, you know, basically just kind of use that as as a as a teaching teaching moment. Um, yeah, so it, it's a good it. way when you're producing videos that are kind of uh, you know kind of locked into a time, you know, to use those short videos to really talk about current current events, and that way you don't have to go back and and keep refilming all those, those those lectures that you might have done maybe three months, six months in advance. Great. In our last minute or two, I want to uh, address what um, Zijan and, and um, Lauren and JT are talking about in the chat and probably a couple of other people, and that's about speaker presence. Do you need, when you make your videos, to have your little talking head there as well? The answer is, it depends, but Research shows that generally, no, you don't need to do that. Now, in foreign languages, as Lauren points out, being able to see my mouth move as I talk is a really important thing, right? And certainly having your students um, practice with each other, that's going to be an important thing. If the, the big caveat is, 
In Kaltura, for example, if you've got that little picture-in-picture -picture window, your file size is double what your regular file size would be. So if it's you know X number of megabytes for just the screen picture, if you have the screen or your slideshow that you're talking about, if you have your face and the slideshow, it's double that size. So think about that with bandwidth issues. Is that really necessary? I don't know. It often not is, is, is sort of the question. And we've got links on the activity sheet um, to some research that um, Timo, I think, has uh, curated and found about that. So that's what we've got. Um, I'm happy to stick around for the next couple of questions. Uh, I'm sorry, the next couple of minutes to answer or to try to answer any other questions. I invite moderators to stick around as long as that's necessary as well. Um, it's two o'clock. Thank you for joining us. Come back next week. We're going to have more labs. Um, invite your friends, et cetera, et cetera, throughout the semester. So thank you again. And again, the activity sheet is a resource that we will try to keep up. You can go back and refer to it. Um, add more questions to it. I don't know if we'll ever remember to respond to those questions, but um, it's there. All right. Thank you all. All right, we've got a question from Ann. Um, Ann, you want to turn on your microphone and, and just sort of jump in? Sure. Um, right. I was trying to use uh, WebEx. Uh, or at least receive a web. And every time I turned on my audio, I was told that I had a lot of static, a lot of problems. But it doesn't seem to be the case when I'm using Zoom or, or this or any other form. And I was wondering if that's possible, that it could be a different form of media, or if there maybe I'd done something different, but I don't know. All right, that sounds like a technical issue. Um, David, Bill, anyone? I'll go ahead and stop it, Karen. Thank you.